one of the reasons we develop concentration is so that we can see things clearly as they happen. In particular, so we can gain discernment. which in one of the passages is defined as right discernment into arising and passing away. As the mind gets more and more centered, you begin to see things just coming up, and if you don't run with them, they dissolve. And more come up, and again, if you don't run with them, they dissolve away. If you do run with them, it's like running with scissors. In other words, you could turn them into worlds with which you then stab yourself. And so one of the things you have to learn is whenever a thought comes up or whenever any kind of potential for a thought world comes up, you just want to let it burst like a bubble without your getting involved in it, without your trying to make anything more than that out of it. I remember hearing someone once talking about how as the mind got really quiet and you could see mental events and physical events on a very subtle level, it all seemed very light. And very ephemeral. And the idea being that once you saw how insubstantial everything was, then you would lose interest. There's actually more going on. Just seeing things arising and passing away is not what the Buddha talked about. When he defines watching arising and passing away, it's not simply things coming and going away. He says you have to see origination as well. Now, origination here means seeing how these things are caused. What is it in the mind that gives rise to these things to begin with? So it's not simply that you're a passive observer watching some TV show and you have the choice of getting involved in the show or not. But essentially the show has been offered to you, and you have the choice of saying yes or no. You're actually the producer of the show. There's something going on in the mind that keeps churning these things out. And you want to be able to see that, because if you don't see that, then no matter how much you let go or relax or let go of your grasp, the potentials are always there for you to grab onto things again, to create more problems for yourself. And if you really get into the understanding this process of origination, you begin to realize how it's potentially never-ending. It's a self-sustaining process. You have consciousness that feeds off a of craving. And then the craving feeds off of consciousness, and then these processes just go around and around and around, keep each other going, along with all the other factors of dependent core rising. And it's when you see that potential that even little tiny things in your mind, which as you simply watch them arising and pass away in the present moment, seem so innocent and so light, are actually little tiny hooks that can pull you into monster narratives that could go for a long, long time. This is why one of the basic emotions or attitudes that underlie the practice and motivate the practice and then actually get strengthened by the practice is sangwega, which sometimes we translate as dismay, sometimes we translate it as sense of being chastened. But it goes deeper than that. It's actually related to the word for terror. Seeing how these little tiny things could pull you into very long, long narratives that would not end very easily. And until you see that, until you really appreciate that, you're not going to be able to dig deep enough, or you'll be motivated to dig deep enough to figure out what the ultimate cause of all this is. It's all too easy to think, well, they just arise and pass away, and it's my choice of whether I want to hold on to them or not. I once talked to someone saying that the natural position of your hand is not to grasp, it's to let go. And therefore, awakening is just a very natural process. You let things simply relax, and you relax your way into nirvana. 
I have yet to see the Buddha describe it that way. The practice, he said, is one of effort. There's that Thai idiom that you meditate, and that meditation is doing an effort. And it's not just a Thai idiom, it's actually there in the Pali Canon. You make an effort, you're resolute, you're ardent, heedful. Because you see the dangers all around, that sense of terror. That's what gives you your motivation, combined with a sense of confidence that there is a way out and that this is it. There's a science fiction story I read years back in which there was a planet to which all criminals were sent. And before you were sent, you went, underwent certain operations. They gave you stainless steel nails and stainless steel teeth to live on this planet. And you got there, and it was just a very weird location. People had nothing really to do. There were these little hump-like animals that would move around. They looked just like part of the earth. And they would move onto you, and they would give you a kind of food, but then they would also leave behind these seeds on your skin. And then the seeds would grow into body parts. This is what the criminals were used for. Because little hump-like animals would then come around afterwards and harvest the body parts, and then they would be sent off to other parts of the universe. So the criminals were there to make little heads, arms, livers, whatever. And it was a really boring existence for them, and not all that pleasant. To the extent to which they would get together and talk about it, they would say, well, at least we, we don't live forever. This is going to end, because they had been sentenced to life sentences there. And the big shocker at the end of the story was it turned out that they had actually been sent to a planet where they were going to be immortal. They would live forever like this. And that was what drove them crazy, and that's why they had noticed when they first arrived there that everybody just seemed sort of totally depleted in terms of any kind of living life energy. And the horror and the terror of living forever. in a place in which there was no real prospect of any kind of satisfaction. And if you can develop that attitude towards samsara, that it's a long process, and there are a few baits that lead you to keep coming back and coming back and coming back, but then the payoff is, is pretty miserable. If you can develop that attitude and really do have that sense of terror that comes from these little movements in the mind are not innocent. There's another story. A friend of mine who was a novelist wrote one time about a group of Chinese gods. It split into two factions, the male gods versus the female gods. And they had a storytelling contest. And it seemed like the gods were determined to make the characters in the story as miserable as possible. And in the novel you saw both the, the gods and the goddesses as they were getting engaged in the storytelling contest. One chapter would be told by the male gods, another chapter would be told by the female gods. But there was also the story itself that they were coming up with. And it was just one disaster after another. And at the very end, Kuan Yin shows up, and she says, well, now that you've invented this story, you're going to have to live it. And the final scene is of the gods in terror being actually falling down from heaven down to earth as they were going to be reborn into these various roles that they had invented. And so when you think about the various possibilities of how you can be reborn, and this is why rebirth is such an essential part of the practice, essential part of the teaching realizing that these little innocent movements of the mind, these very natural-seeming arisings and passing away, which look pretty innocent in the present moment, have this long-term potential for suffering. And it's not natural that you let go. I'm going to be perfectly blunt. I don't know anybody who was born because their parents let go. The process just keeps going on and on and on.
that it's having that sense of how serious this is that keeps you motivated, keeps you heedful, and motivates you to look deeper and deeper into what are the causes of these little arisings, arisings, arisings in the mind. There's a complex web that has the potential for going on forever. It's not like consciousness has to depend on this body. The process keeps creating all the conditions it needs in order to keep going and give rise to another body and another one and another one. Someone asked me the other day if I were to be born, which nationality I would choose. And tried to think and I just couldn't find any that didn't have any didn't have a lot of severe drawbacks. In the East or the West, Europe, America, wherever, Asia. There are drawbacks everywhere you could be born. You go to the Deva world, the Devas get generally pretty heedless. Not all of them. In fact that John Swat said if you really do have to be reborn, don't try to come back to the human world for a while, because it's going to be pretty bad. best thing you can do is, if you find that you can't finish the work in this lifetime, make the dedication that you want to come back to a place where you will meet with the, the Dharma and be motivated to practice it, and let the other chips fall where they may. But make sure you've got these ones firmly in place, because it's the only way out. Remember, Sangwega is not a pleasant emotion. There's a very late part of the canon called the Apadanas, which are essentially poems written by monks in order to please lay people, to get them to give money for the various monasteries and monuments they've been building and were trying to maintain. And they presented the path as a very pleasant one. You gave a gift and you dedicated it to awakening, then you would be guaranteed awakening. You would have a pleasant ride through samsara, sometimes as a deva, sometimes as a human being. When you're a human being, you were an emperor or a king or a queen. When you're devas, you're kings of the devas, queens of the devas. And then finally there would come a point where you decided you had enough of all that pleasure. And you'd experience a sense of sangwega as, as joy, that you'd had a sufficiency, and everything just kind of naturally fell from your grasp. A sangwega was presented that way so it would be attractive, and there was an ulterior motive. And you can look around, you can find there many ways of presenting the Dharma that are very attractive, and there's that motive. They've got institutions they want to keep going. You might call this the politics of arising and passing away. It's all very light, very nice, and you just, out of a sense of satisfaction and lightness, just let go. If there's any sangwega, it's, it's joyful, it's pleasant. But the practice doesn't work that way, because it leads to complacency, it leads to not really seeing the dangers all around you and the dangers inside. You have to be very alive to the fact that these little arisings and passings away in the mind are not as innocent as they seem. That way you're watchful, that way you're on your guard so that you will find a way of digging down and getting to an awareness that is not involved in these things. It takes you out of time and space entirely. That's the only thing that's really satisfying. But because we're so used to this process of going for the arisings and passings away, it takes a huge change of mind and a huge change of heart. As we all know, one of the few things that gives us a change of heart is a sense of 
how foolish we've been. And the dangers that face us. That's one way of motivating yourself. The other, of course, is realizing that if you are willing to go through the difficulties of the path, there is a genuine escape. There is genuine happiness, which doesn't depend on language or culture or anything like that. It's standard all around. It requires some difficulties. It's like being lost in the forest. You don't like being in the brambles. You don't like being obscured by the trees. But you have to go through some brambles and trees in order to get out. In other words, you're trapped in the forest. The only way out of the forest is to go through the forest. But once you escape, once you're free, then you realize that it's more than worth the effort and the difficulty that went into getting out. That's the confidence that keeps you going. So it's a combination of terror and confidence that keeps us on the path and prevents us from losing our way. <laughs>